Hello, sugar plums. I am recording a video on solving radical equations for you guys. And this one is going to reference assignment number 25, lesson 7.6. So when we talk about solving radical equations, we're looking at first, a radical equation is any equation with a variable inside or under a root. Now, some examples of radical equations would include equations such as x plus two is equal to five, or perhaps the cube root of x minus three is equal to two. Both of these are radical equations. In order to solve a radical equation, we must first, number one, isolate the radical, as in get the radical by itself on one side of the equation. Next, you want to eliminate the radical by raising both sides. to the inverse of the root. I know it's a lot of writing, but let me go ahead and explain this. All right, so one of the previous equations we had was the square root of x plus two, I don't remember, <laughs> okay, equals to four. So if we wanted to solve this, because you have a square root here, you want to eliminate the square root. To eliminate the square root, you would do its inverse and square both sides. Now, what ends up happening is that when you square both sides, the power cancels out the root, leaving you with what's inside the root. And of course, on the right side, you would go ahead and square the four, and that would give you 16. So the goal here in step two is to eliminate the radical. We accomplished that goal, so we're good. Now, what if the problem had been a cube root instead, the cube root of x equals two, four, okay? Because we're dealing with a cube root, you want to raise both sides to the third power, it's inverse, so you can eliminate the cube root. Now, once again, what will happen is that the power will eliminate the root, leaving you with whatever's inside the roots. And then on the right side, you would do a four cube, which go ahead, which will give you 64, okay? So the second step is always to eliminate the radical. Now, most of the problems that you guys are going to be looking at in this session, they're going to be the square root equations, the radical equations with just square roots. I don't think you have any cube roots, okay? Now, the next step, guys, step number three, is to go ahead and solve the equation. Solve the equation. Now, be careful though, there is a step number four, and this is a critical step here. You need to check the solutions. Now, why are you checking the solutions? Sometimes you find a solution, and the solution doesn't make the original problem true. If it doesn't make the original problem true, you need to reject it. So it would become an extraneous solution. And if it's the only solution, you would have no solution. So once again, if you solve an equation, you take the answer, plug it back into the original problem, it makes the original problem false. You cannot count it as a solution. You must reject it. So you would end up with no solution. So that solution that you found but didn't make the problem true, refer to it as an extraneous solution. All right, guys. I am going to go over some of the questions with you. By the way, there's right here, when we talk about these equations, there's an exception we need to be careful with. Let me go ahead and mention it. We'll be seeing some questions. Uh, similar to this, okay? 
So when we talk about solving these radicals, guys, if you're looking at a square root, remember, you cannot take the square root of a negative value. So if you ever encounter an equation where the square root is equal to a negative value, a negative number, for example, uh, the square root of, let's say, mm, x plus 2 is equal to negative 3, something like this. This problem is saying, I have to find a number such that when I take its square root, and it would give me a negative value. Now, think about it, guys. We haven't seen the imaginary numbers yet, so we had to talk about the imaginary numbers, but at the beginning of chapter, we learned that we cannot take the even root. You cannot take the even root of a negative number. That's impossible. The fourth root of negative 16, that's impossible. So, for these problems right here, when you have a square root equation that is equal to a negative value, it will lead to no solution because you cannot find a single value such that when you plug it back into the equation, that would make the problem true. But wait, what if you forgot this rule and you went around and tried to solve this problem? Let's see what would happen. So you would square both sides here, and you would get x plus 2 is equal to 9. Subtract the 2 from both sides to solve it, and you get x equals to 7. Now you got to go back in and check your solution. How do you check your solution? You take the solution, go back into the original problem, and substitute it in for the variable. So 7 plus 2 equals to negative 3. 7 plus 2 is 9. The square root of 9 is 3. And so you have to ask this question, is this statement true or is it false? Is three equal to negative three? Well, obviously not, okay? It's definitely not equal to negative three. So the answer we found, okay, it did not make the original problem true. So therefore you cannot count it as a solution. You must reject it as a solution. And since it was the only solution, you would say there was no solution to the problem. This is why it's critical for you guys to check your solutions okay critical all right so um hopefully you guys can just look at the problem ahead of time and you can see that it's a square root equal to a negative value oh okay you cannot take the square root of a number and get a negative value so automatically that's no solution all right guys so now what i'm going to do is go through some of these questions that are on the assignment now problems, let's see here. The problems all the way up to number, okay, number seven, those are review questions. So the problems that pertain to solving radical equations start with number eight. Although number eight is a vocabulary question, number nine is also a vocabulary question. So the problems really start with number 10. Now, if for some reason you're still having issues with numbers one through eight of course you're welcome to go ahead and send me an email numbers one through seven that is okay send me an email text me or send me a message on microsoft teams and then i'll go ahead and respond to you okay so i'm going to start with problem number 10. now problem number 10 i have the square root of 5x minus 9 is equal, I mean, minus four is equal to zero. We want to add the four to both sides. So we get the square root of five X minus nine is equal to four. Now we want to go ahead and eliminate the square root by squaring both sides. So we get five X minus nine is equal to 16. So once you have your radical isolated, you want to go ahead and square it because that's the end of the square root and then go about solving this, guys. Now, we add nine to both sides, so we get five x is equal to 25, and divide both sides by five, so the answer turns out to be five. Now, we could check it, guys, but you really don't have to. This one is gonna come out five times five minus nine minus four should give you zero. Five times five is 25, 25 minus nine, is 16 and so the square root of 16 you know is 4 
and four minus four does give you zero. So it works out, okay? So that's problem number 10. Problem number 11 is very similar, so I'm not gonna do that one. Now, problem number 12 is difficult, guys. Okay, so for problem number 12, pay careful attention. We've got the square root of 18 minus x is equal to x plus two. On a difficulty scale of one through four, this would be a four for you guys, okay? So yes, the square root is already isolated. We're gonna get rid of it. Now, how do we get rid of it? We're gonna square both sides. So 18 minus x comes out. Now here's the catch right here, guys. When you square that x plus two, you have a binomial squared, which means you have x plus two times x plus two. So you have to boil this, okay? Expand it. So you have to do x times x, which gives you an x squared. x times two gives you two x. 2 times x is another 2x, and then 2 times 2 gives you 4. So all of that expanded to x squared, add these two together, plus 4x, and then plus 4. That was a lot, okay? I told you it was difficult. Now we got to go to work. So this one right here is a quadratic equation, guys. How do we know it's a quadratic? It's got the quadratic term, the x squared term. So we want to set the quadratic equal to zero and solve. So I'm gonna add the x to both sides. I'm also going to subtract the 18 from both sides. I'm doing two things at once here. So over here, this cancels out, this cancels out. So you're left with zero is equal to x squared plus five x minus 14, all right? So now, your quadratic has been set equal to zero, and this is a beautiful quadratic. Why do I call it a beautiful quadratic? Because it's factorable, so I'm gonna factor it. What are two numbers that multiply to give me a negative 14 and add to give me a positive five? That would be a positive seven and a negative two. So there's your two factors. And of course, you simply have to ask the question, what number plus seven makes this zero? Negative seven. What number minus two makes this zero? Positive two. But wait, there's more. We have two answers here, guys. We gotta go back and check, okay? Let's start with x equals to negative seven. Now, this is x equals to two, positive two, guys, not negative two, okay? So we go back into the original problem. We're gonna plug in that negative seven for x, everywhere we find an x. So I get 18 minus negative seven is equal to negative seven plus two. Negative seven plus two is a negative five. 18 plus seven is going to give you 25. The square root of 25 is five. Is five equal to negative five? Absolutely not. So since the negative seven did not make the original problem true, we cannot count it as a solution. So we're gonna go ahead and reject the negative seven. Now, just to be on the safe side, let's go ahead and check the two. Oh, I erased too much, Shazam. All right, so I'm just gonna go back and rewrite those values, okay? And the values again were x equals to negative seven, x equals to two. So I'm gonna check with the two. Now for the two guys, I'm gonna go back into the original problem, plug in the two for x and work it out. 18 minus two is 16. 2 plus 2 is 4. Square root of 16 is 4. So 4 is equal to 4. Check. So that means that this answer works and this one doesn't work. So the only one you plug in for the solution, guys, is the 2. That is it. If you write both of them in there into Math Excel for school, guess what? You're going to get the problem wrong. So guys, be careful. All right, so the next one is problem number 13. Now for problem number 13, I've got the square root of 8x plus three plus nine equals to zero. This one, unlike the previous one we just did, number 12, way easier. So I'm subtracting nine from both sides. 
Now, this is, guys, that exception I was chatting about earlier. The square root cannot equal to a negative value. If the square root is equal to a negative value, that's no solution. Now, why is it no solution? Because you cannot take the square root of a, of a number and get a negative value for it. If you try to solve this, the answer you get when you plug it back in will not work out, okay? Now, problem 14, everybody. Um, 3x minus 2 equals 2, the square root of 2 minus 3x. Now, for this one, you have a radical equal to another radical, so you have the radicals already isolated on both sides, so you want to square both sides to get rid of the radicals. So you get 3x minus 2 is equal to 2 minus 3x. And then you solve this, okay? So I'm going to add the 3x to both sides. So I end up with 6x minus 2 is equal to 2. Add the 2 to both sides. So I get 6x is equal to 4. And obviously, we're going to have to divide both sides by 6. I'm running out of room at the bottom, so I get 4 over 6. And guys, you've got to reduce this. This 4 over 6, if you plug it into the computer, it will mark the problem wrong. You reduce this to 2 thirds. Now, we need to go back and check this one, guys. So let's go back and check it, all right? So I'm just going to go right over here and erase all of this. I'm going to take that 2 thirds, plug it in for every single x, and see if it makes the problem true. So 3 times 2 thirds minus 2 equals 2, 2 minus 3 times 2 thirds. All right, let's work it out. So on this one right here, the threes cancel out, leaving you with 2 minus 2. 2 minus 2 under the radical is going to give you 0. Okay, right here, guys, look at that. Both of these cancel out. 2 minus 2 is also 0. Is 0 equal to 0? Yes. Okay. So this one works out. So the answer is the two thirds. All right, everybody. Let's see what's next here. Ooh, we have some Pythagorean theorem questions. All right. So guys, the Pythagorean theorem, it says that the sum of the squares of the two legs of a triangle, a right triangle, will be equivalent to the hypotenuse squared. So since you guys just recently had geometry, I'm guessing you remember all of this. Yeah, I can hear some of you right now saying, no, Miss Alcira, I don't remember any of this. Okay, the longest side of the triangle is called the hypotenuse, guys. That's your hypotenuse, and that's C. And then the other two sides, by the way, the hypotenuse is directly across from the right angle. And then the other two sides of the triangle, they represent the legs of the triangle. It doesn't matter which one is A, which one is B. Uh, typically, they make the smaller value, okay, A, and the larger value, B. So let's say this is A and this one is B. So when we talk about the Pythagorean theorem, if we take the hypotenuse, we square it. This will equal to the sum of the two legs squared. So here's your little problem, guys, for number 15. We have this right triangle right here where the height of the right triangle is 18. The base of the right, the length of the base of the right triangle is six. Okay, I'm gonna put it right inside the triangle because I'm running out of room. And your job is to figure out the hypotenuse. So in other words, you have to find the value of C. So you wanna go into the Pythagorean theorem, plug in those values. We'll call 6A and then 18 will be the B value. So we're gonna plug them in. So we get six squared plus 18 squared. Now guys, this one says type an exact answer using radicals or simplify it, okay? So C squared is equal to 36. Now, for some reason, 18 squared just escaped me, guys. That is so sad. I think it's four, no, 364, because 20 squared is 400, 364. And when you add them together, you do get 400. 
Now, guys, you got to remember this. The last step when you're doing the uh, Pythagorean theorem is to take the square root. I hope you guys remember this from geometry. So C will equal to 20. So there's your answer. Okay. By the way, on this problem right here, they're not asking for the measurement, but there are instances where when you're working on Pearson, they will actually ask you for the measurements. Okay. So be careful. This next one, problem number 16. Okay. Uh, let's see. They give you this side right here, which is two. And this side over here, by the way, this is seven meters and this one is two meters. They were asking you to find the value of this side over here. Now, the missing side, guys, is not the hypotenuse. The seven is the hypotenuse. That's your C value. So again, go into the Pythagorean theorem and plug in the values of C and the other value, which are we going to go ahead and call A. So essentially, you guys are looking for B, okay? So you're gonna go into the Pythagorean theorem and plug in those values for C and A. So you get seven squared is equal to two squared plus B squared. Seven squared is 49, seven times seven. Two squared is four plus the B squared. Subtract four from both sides, guys. So that's gonna give you 45, which is equal to B squared. And then you wanna take the square root of both sides. Now, when you take the square root of both sides, guys, okay, be careful. Remember these problems, sometimes they want you to write in simplest radical form. Can we simplify the 45? Yes, 45 is nine times five. Nine is a perfect square. So we take the square root of nine. What's the square root of nine? Three. We cannot take the square root of five, so we leave it inside the root. So this would be the answer in simplified and simplest radical form. All right. Now the next one is a little word problem involving Pythagorean theorem, but we've already done it. So this one will be just like um, problem number. 15 okay so number 17 is very similar to problem 15 so just left one to problem 15 and then number 18 here now this one i am actually going to do it for number 18 and let me try and read it very slowly so you have a spotlight is mounted on the eaves of a house 12 feet above the ground okay so the eaves of the house, they're 12 feet above the ground. All right, so let's say this is the ground, this is where the eaves is. So this distance is 12 feet. A flower bed runs between the house and a sidewalk. So the closest the ladder can get, so let's say there's a little flower bed right here, okay? So the closest the ladder can be placed to the house is five feet. So your job is to figure out how long a ladder is needed. We'll call this the ladder. Okay, that's your ladder right there, guys. How long of a ladder is needed so that an electrician can reach the place where the light is mounted? So guys, essentially, the wall and the ground are perpendicular so the wall is perpendicular to the ground so they form a right angle right there so therefore your right angle is right here which means this would be your hypotenuse and the other two sides will represent a and b so again this is just like number 17 you go into the pythagorean theorem c squared equals to a squared plus b squared and substitute everything in there guys so 9 squared plus 12 squared. 9 squared is going to give you 81. And then 12 squared is going to be 144. And then you want to go ahead and add them together. So that's going to give you 225. Ooh, nice. I'm loving it. That's a beautiful number. So when you take the square root, guys, you get C is equal to 25. All right, so in other words, the ladder needs to be 25 
feet long. Oh, wait a minute. That is not 25. Shazam. Oh, guys, I just made a mistake. Oh, let's go back. I just made a mistake there. That is not 25. What am I talking about? I'm trying to finish this problem very quickly. We need to simplify this. Now, let's see here. Uh, the left ladder needs to be blah, blah, blah. Do they want us to round this? Okay. So, hmm. I guess. And the skirt of 225 is, I think, 15. Yeah, 15. All right. So 15 feet, guys, not 25. Where did I come from with that 25? That wouldn't make any sense. Shazam, 25 squared is 625, everybody. Okay. So definitely not. The answer is 15. All right. So now, on this next one, it's another word problem, but they want you to type in the exact answer using radicals as needed. A wire is to be attached to support a telephone pole because of surrounding buildings, sidewalks, and roadways. The wire must be anchored exactly 14 feet from the base of the pole. The telephone company workers have only 30 feet of cable. And one feet of that must be used to attach the cable to the pole. By the way, there's a nice figure here. And to stake, to, to stake it to the ground, how high from the base of the pole can the wire be attached? All right, guys. So on this one right here, first, we're going to go ahead. I am going to go ahead and sketch out the figure for you so you can see what this looks like. And then we'll go ahead and work it out, okay? So um, here's the, okay, we'll call this the light pole right here, okay? And then the cable is wrapped around the top of the light pole, okay? And then uh, it is extended to the ground, okay? Uh, and it is anchored exactly seven feet away from um not seven feet shazam what am i talking about that's not seven feet it is anchored exactly 14 feet from the base of the pole all right let me go ahead and erase that 14 feet 14 feet all right 14 feet from the base of the pole so there's the pole right there and remember that pole is perpendicular to the ground so therefore we have that right angle there guys now remember Here's the tricky part to this problem. For this problem right here, guys, it says we have 30 feet of cable, okay? And one, it should be foot, it says feet. One foot of that must be used to attach the cable to the pole. So this part right here, guys, is one foot. And then the rest of it is extended out. Now, if you've got 30 feet and you need to use a foot to wrap around the pole, I'll leave you with 29 feet. So the cable is going to be 29 feet. All right. So now your job is to figure out, let's see here. Uh, where's the question? How high from the base of the pole can the wire be attached? So guys, as you can tell, this one right here, the hypotenuse is the cable. So that's your C value. And then the base, the 14 feet, would represent maybe your A value, and you got to figure out the B value. So you're going to go into the Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It's the same thing, guys. You notice I'm writing it as C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. It's still the same thing. Don't worry about how I'm writing it, okay? You still get the exact same answer. All right, guys. So now let's go to work. So we're going to plug in the 14. Plug in the 29. Okay, let me do a better job at writing this. 29 squared is equal to uh, 14 squared plus B squared. Okay, I don't want to steer you guys in the wrong direction. So I'm actually going to do a little multiplication right here. So that's 841 is equal to 14 squared 
which is, oh, Shazam. Okay, I'm blanking out. Oh, that's 196. What am I talking about? 196 plus v squared. Subtract the 196, guys. So I'm going to take my 841, subtract my 196. Ooh, let's try that one more time. 841 minus 196. So I get 645. All right, so how do they want us to do this? Let me see. Oh, it's two parts, guys. So now they want us to go ahead and try to simplify this. 645, if we were to take it and divide it by five, guys, it would leave us with 129. And if you take 129 and divide it by three, that's going to leave you with 43. So in other words, there's no perfect square that goes into 645, okay? So the 645 cannot be simplified. So all you have to do now is take the square root. So the answer for this, guys, okay? Oh, this is supposed to be, oh, Shazam. I'm putting C in here. That's not C. Okay, let's fix that a little bit there. That's 645. And this will equal to b squared. Now, you want to take the square root. You cannot simplify the square root of 645. So the answer would be b equals to the square root of 645. Yes, you have to plug it in here. By the way, most of you will end up with an answer that cannot be simplified. So you leave it like that. There's a second part to the question. And the second part of the question wants you to actually figure out the value, guys, okay? Here, let me go ahead and type in this answer so I can go to the second part so I can see uh, where they want you to round it to, okay? Um, hold on. The rounding is two decimal places, guys. So you got to go ahead and put that on your calculator, okay? Now, when I plug it into my calculator, I'm going to tell you guys exactly what I get. Let me turn this sideways over here. The square root of, hold on a second, the square root of 645. And this is going to come out to, I'm going to write out the long decimal so you guys can see it. It's 25.396. They want you to round it to the nearest hundredth. Okay, so the nine is in the hundredth. So look at the six right there, the third number. Since it's greater than five, you add one to the 39. So that's going to become 25.40 or 0.4. So there's your answer. 25.4 is the length of the pole. And guys, it's going to be in feet. All right, that was number 19. Yeah, that was a bit challenging. Okay, this next one is also challenging, but it is one part. All right, so I'm going to erase this one. Here we go. The formula, V equals the square root of 2GH, gives the velocity V in feet per second of an object when it falls h feet accelerated by gravity which is g and feet per second squared if g is approximately 32 feet per second uh per second squared okay we got to put that square in there find how far an object has fallen if its velocity is 208 feet per second. So guys, they want you to go ahead and plug in these values into this formula right here, okay? So they want you to take these values for S, the value for V, go into the formula, plug in the value for V, plug in the value for G, and then work it out to find the value of H. They want you to find H. So let us do it. I'm going to change the color here. I'm going to plug in my 208 for V. Then I'm going to substitute my 32 for G. So now I am going to do the 2 times 32, which is 64H. 
Ooh, guys. Ooh, I am so tempted to take the square to 64, but I won't because I need to get rid of the square root. So I'm going to square both sides. All right. Now, 208 squared, I definitely need the calculator for that. So let me go ahead and throw this on a calculator. Obviously, it's going to be a very, very large number. So 208 squared. Oh, I got to clear this out. Let me clear this out. Okay, 208 squared. That's going to come out to be, oh, Shazam, 43,264. And then on the other side, this will equal to 64H. Now, take that and divide it, guys, by the 64. So you want to divide both sides by 64. So H, okay, which represent the number of feet the object has fallen, is going to be 676. And there you are. Okay, so once again, guys, I think I may have gone a little too fast on this one. So let me backtrack just a little bit for those of you who just missed all of that. So what I did was to go ahead and square both sides. When I square the 208, put it on my calculator, okay? Either use your X squared button on the calculator, 208, hit the X squared button, okay? Well, no, let's not do it like that. Let's do it this way, okay? 208, hit your X squared button. And then you'll get the 43, 264. Now over here, the two cancels out, the square cancels out the root, leaving you with your 64H. You wanna solve for H, so you divide both sides by 64. Now, this would represent your answer. By the way, guys, this is going to be in feet. They give you the units of measurement already, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, now I see why you guys had such a hard time with this one. Okay, this one is due on Friday, so you guys have quite some time to do it. Well, at least now you have the problems that you really, really need being worked out for you. So all you have to do guys is pop this video open and work out your assignment with me, with the video. In psychology guys, it has been suggested that the number S of nonsense syllables that a person can repeat consecutively depends on his or her IQ, I, according to the equation S equals to two times the square root of I minus nine. And so your job is to calculate this relation, using the relationship to estimate the IQ, which is the I, of a person who can repeat six nonsense syllables consecutively. So in other words, they want you to substitute six in for S, and then they want you to go ahead and solve for I. So we're gonna go ahead and plug in that six for S, and so this is what we end up with. Now we go about solving this. I'm gonna add nine to both sides, guys. So I get 15. Now, once I get here, okay, I can do one of two things. I can divide both sides by two, or I could just go ahead and square both sides. By squaring both sides right here, I am going to accomplish two things. I am going to get rid of the square root, I am also going to square the two. 15 squared, plug that into your calculator. That's 225. And then over here, you're going to square the two. That's four. And when you square the square root of i, they cancel each other out. So the square cancels out the power, leaving you with i. Now, guys, you want to divide both sides by four. So I will equal to 225 over four. Now, according to this, they want you to round it to the nearest integer. So you wanna go ahead and grab your calculator and divide the 225 by four, which is gonna be about, let me see here, 54.8. 
but I'm gonna put it on the calculator just to make sure. And they want you to round it to the nearest whole number. So if you get 54.8 and you plug that on the, on the computer, guys, it will mark it wrong because they want a whole number, the nearest integer, a whole number, no decimals, guys. Okay, so 225 divided by, let's see here, four, turns out, turns out to be 56.25. I'm gonna write it out so you guys can see this, 56.25. Since we're trying to round this to the nearest whole number, we're trying to determine if we should change the six to a seven or leave it as a six, what do we look at? We look at the two, it's less than five, so we leave it alone. So this one is going to be 56. All right, guys, that one was problem number 21 on assignment 25. Okay, next one. And this is the last one, number 22. Number 22. By the way, guys, on these assignments right here, all of them, they have extra credit. I realize one of the assignments has only 19 points. Normally, all the assignments are supposed to have uh, a total of 20 points. And so if there's anything in excess of 20, then, you know, you earn some extra credit points. But this one right here, it has a total of uh, 22, but the one that I was mentioning has apparently 19. So I gotta go adjust that and make the grade out of 19 instead of 20. Okay, if the three lengths of the side of a triangle are known, Heron's formula can be used to find its area. If A, B, and C are the three lengths of the sides, Heron's formula, or Heron's formula, for area is A is equal to S times S minus A, S minus B times S minus C. That's Heron's formula, where S is half the perimeter of the triangle. So one half, how do we calculate the perimeter of the triangle? We do, we add up all the sides, but we want half of all the sides, half of the sum of all the sides. So guys, use the formula to find the area of the triangle. So I'm gonna click to view this image right here. This is what I am. Yeah, okay. So my sides are um, six, um, 10, and 14. So first I'm gonna calculate the value of S, which is half the perimeter. So half the sum of all the sides. So I am going to add the six plus 10 plus 14, all right? So six plus 10 plus 14, guys, is going to give me 30. Half of 30 is 15. So I've got my S value, which is 15. So now I'm going to go into Heron's formula or Heron formula, okay? And I am going to plug in all these values for A. Does it matter which one is A, which one is B, which one is C? No, it does not matter. But typically, the smaller value is A. The middle value is B, the largest value is C, guys, okay? And then, of course, you plug in your S. So S is 15. So 15 minus six, 15 minus 10, 15 minus four, okay? And then work it out. So you get 15 times nine times five times Okay, this is supposed to be 14. Now, why did I leave out my one there, okay? Times one. Now, this one right here, guys, let me see how many parts is it? Ooh, it's a two parts. Type in an exact answer using radicals as needed. All right, guys. So here, I'm going to start simplifying this. I'm not gonna multiply it all the way. I'm just gonna start simplifying. So what in the world am I talking about? Here's what I'm talking about, okay? If I were to take 15 and break it up into three times five, I'm going to take this five right there and move it over here, okay? I'm moving it, and then times nine. That's still the same thing. You're multiplying by one, so you really don't need that, okay? What I want you guys to notice is that you have a pair of fives, and then you have a nine, 
which are perfect squares. So when you simplify this, when you take this right here, the double pair of fives, remember when you have a pair, you take one out, leave, uh, take one out when you have a pair. You take the square root of nine, that's going to give you three. And of course, this right here, you cannot take the square root of it, so it remains under the root. And the last step is to multiply, so you get 15 radical three. Now, some of you may have calculators that can do all of this for you, so you can actually go on here and multiply it all together. Additionally, some of you may prefer this instead. Five times five is 25. The square root of 25 is the five, the square root of nine is the three, and you multiply them together to get 15 radical two. So guys, this is the first part of the problem, the 15 radical two. And then of course, there's the second part of the problem. Let me type this in so I can see where they want you to round this to. So 15 and then a radical three. And let's go ahead and see where they want you to round it to. Okay, so the next one, they want you to find the decimal approximation for 15 radical three and round it to two decimal places, guys, two decimal places. So you go on your calculator. You can do 15 times radical three. You could have done the square root of 15 times nine times five. It doesn't matter. Just go ahead and plug it into a calculator, people. So you wanna do the square root of, um, let's see here, no, 15 times the square root of three. And so the answer turns out to be this. I need a spot to write it, guys. Okay, I'm just gonna erase this. The answer turns out to be 25.9807, okay? I'm writing it out so you can see it. That's not the correct answer. I have to round this to the nearest hundredth, as in two decimal places. So there's my hundredth. I look at the number after the hundredth place. And since it's less than five, I'm going to leave it alone. So the answer is going to be 25.98 people. And that's going to be in square miles. There you go. And guys, that is it. Okay. So while I've got your attention, those of you who are still watching, ha, I should have done this at the beginning of the video. Next video, I'm putting the announcements at the beginning, okay? So announcement number one, remember every Friday we have some type of assessment, whether it be a quiz or a test. And this Friday, we are having quiz number eight. So make sure you complete it by midnight this Friday. Many of you have multiple assignments as well as, as, well as multiple quizzes you haven't completed. So please complete the assignments. Those of you who are seniors, your last day is going to be May 15, your class of 2020. You know what? Let me turn on the video camera for this so you guys can see me. <laughs> okay. So go class of 2020, May 15th is the deadline. Guys, remember, friends don't let friends fail. So if you know of a friend who hasn't been doing my math lab, what in the world, not my math lab, math Excel, you better get on your friend and have a conversation with your friend, guys, because I have quite a few people, especially in my everyday class, who haven't completed a single assignment. And I call, I text, I send emails, and now I'm about to send you a video, okay? And these students are not doing anything. So, guys, please help your friend out. Last but not least, I know you noticed some of you, I started populating the zeros, okay? So if you got some of the assignments you did not complete and they're past due, I am going to start, well, I started putting the zeros in. So, guys, you can always go back and work on those previous assignments for a late grade, but make sure you do them okay um i think that's it i don't have anything else for you guys i am also going to send out an email all my videos have been uploaded to my youtube channel so this video right here was done on zoom guys remember i can't use zoom in the classroom so i'm creating the videos on zoom i love love zoom go zoom i am zooming with zoom video 
that's a little joke for you guys since I can't see you face to face. Okay. Bye guys.